Well, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be back. When I was here in October, we had that freak snowstorm. What an odyssey that is for a California boy, trying to get out to the airport in the middle of that snowstorm. Um, for those of you who have not met me before, it's nice to meet each and every one of you. Um, Silarena.com is my portfolio. If you're interested in seeing um, more of the work I do, that's the place to head. Speedlighting.com is where I intermittently write about the world of lighting. And then I love Twitter, man. That whole, you know, blogging is heavy lifting, and Twitter is great. 140 characters, and I got to get it all started and finished. So if you follow folks on Twitter, feel free to follow me. Um, Nikonians, we're going to talk about Canon buttons and dials, but I promise you the vast majority of the concepts that we go through today are really about light. So one of the things that I tell everyone is it's really about the photograph and not about the gear that we created it with. It's many roads to get to the same photo. So with that in mind, why do we use multiple flashes? And I'm going to stand right in your line of sight, and I apologize for that. They told me this is where I'm supposed to stand. They got some gaffer's tape on my right foot. <laughs> so why use multiple flashes? I'm a person who gained a little bit of notoriety by ganging up 12 speed lights, nine of which were borrowed, and made a photograph of my son while he was smashing the heck out of a bunch of Cinderella pumpkins several years ago. And then I got this book deal to write about Canon speed lighting, and that photograph then became the cover of the book. So I often get accused of being a guy who immediately runs out and uses way more speed lights than necessary. And I'll admit, sometimes that's absolutely true. If I have a whole bunch of speed lights around, if we were at a workshop or a meetup or whatever, at some point I'd say, OK, let's see how many speed lights we can get to fire off. But truth be told, I'm really lazy. And if I can get the job done with available light, then that's what I'm going to do. If I can get the job done with one speed light, great. But I want to take you on a quick tour of some of the reasons why you might want to use multiple speed lights. And to be honest, when you hear speed light, just insert the word flash, because the reality is, with the exception of high speed sync, we can do everything I'm going to talk about today with big flash as well. OK? So the traditional approach to using multiple flashes comes out of the studio. So we have the key light, which is the main light on the subject. Then we'll have a fill light, because one of the things to understand about film as well as our digital cameras is that neither can record the full range of brights and darks that we can see. And so oftentimes we've got shadows that have been created, and your eye can see in all the detail you want in those shadows but the camera doesn't have the ability to record the details. So we add a fill light in there. And then, because we went to photo school and we learned about three lighting headshots, we're going to add the accent light on the shoulders and the hair. And you combine those three lights, and you come up with a very classically lit senior portrait. This is my son, Tom. You're going to meet each of my three boys today in photos. Um, and so this was a you know, classically lit senior portrait type headshot that we did. And a lot of people never get beyond this. And that's perfectly fine. If you're doing this classical type of lighting, then understanding the use of that is perfectly fine. But one of the great things that we can do with speed lights, how many of you here are familiar with high speed sync or auto FP sync? High speed sync is a speed light only function. It's available when you put your Canon speed light on top of your Canon camera. And what it does is the camera changes the way that the flash fires. And rather than push out one big pulse of light, it turns it into a machine gun. It goes <laughs> for just a brief fraction of a second. Effectively, it's turning that speed light into a continuous light source, which enables you to use really fast shutter speeds. Normally, with most of our cameras, our ability to for the shutter to fire is limited when the speed light's turned on to a 200th or a 250th of a second. If you have a 5D Mark II, it's going to be a 200th of a second. If you have virtually any other camera, it's going to be a 250th of a second. Now, I live halfway between LA and San Francisco. And the sun is almost always shining in California, of course, except during winter. And living in a sun-drenched environment as I am, it's important for me to be able to control the intensity of that sunlight. So you know 
from your own experience, when you shoot into the sun, you have to add light to your subject because that subject is backlit. So one of the things that happens in high speed sync is it gives us the ability to shoot at a fast shutter speed, a four thousandth of a second in the case of this photograph. And then I had to fill in on the shadowy side of this pit bull, which was the subject of a magazine article that I was photographing for. And in order to get those speed lights to fire in the four thousandth of a second to manage the sun, I had to jump into high speed sync. But the dark side of high speed sync is that when you switch over, it consumes two and a half stops of flash power. So you're effectively, if your speed light is in full power, when you jump over to high speed sync, it's effectively turned over to one sixth power. Because the camera has to, or the speed light has to recycle literally 30,000 times a second for a fraction of a second. So doing a lot of high speed sync work, I gang up two or three speed lights to make up for that power loss. All right. I think later this morning we're going to take a look at how I created this shot. Here's another reason to use multiple speed lights that I think is pretty innovative. Here's a shot I did for a workshop up in Maine. And Canon had sent down literally a suitcase full. I had 24 speed lights. And so I used seven. Why seven? Because I couldn't find my other triple threat bracket. If I could have found that other bracket, I would have used 10. If I could have bolted in 15, I would have bolted in 15. The point was that you see that cable flying in there? That, and I'll show you this technique. I attached one speed light to my camera with an extra long ETTL cord and made that speed light the master. The other six were the slaves, and I controlled that whole system from the back of my camera, and I'll show you that on the screen in a little bit as well, exactly how I do that. But one of the great differences between using several speed lights and using a large power pack is that with our Canon system, we could control the whole party from the back of our LCD. <clears throat> Runner's in the water, I'm in the water, stand is in the water, cable's running through the water, okay? Not worried about any of it. And I'm able to control that whole system from the back of my camera in real time, OK? Now, did I need seven? No. I probably could have filled up this umbrella with three. Keep in mind that a speed light throws the light out to the front. So when you're in a large mod, like a 60-inch silver umbrella, you've got to use three of them or so so that you can fill up each quadrant of that. And the other four were in there really for show. Although I'll say this, the legitimate reason to use them is that you seven speed lights firing at, say, 1 16th power will recycle much faster than three speed lights firing at 1 half power. So the more speed lights you use, the lower each one is going to fire, the faster that whole system. So if you're doing sports photography or any kind of event photography where you need really fast recycle times, ganging up several speed lights inside of a modifier, like that's my, my all-time new favorite right there, the Westcott Apollo Orb. Um, Okay, so another reason to use multiple speed lights. This is what I call gang light. And gang lighting, the difference between gang lighting and just piling a bunch of speed lights inside of a mod is that there's no modifier here. I've literally bolted the speed lights to a piece of oak that I bought at Home Depot, screwed in a bunch of cold shoes. And this was a test shot. This was part of the Smashing Pumpkins shoot. And what stunned me was how beautiful the light was. It truly set me back. I didn't expect this. This was an afterthought. And the image you see on the left is no flash, aperture priority, no exposure compensation. That image on the left is the image that the camera wanted to make. And that sumptuous light, what I call cinematic light, which is the topic of this afternoon's presentation, comes about by underexposing the ambient and then wrapping the subject, my son, Vin, son number two. Now you've met two out of the three. All right wrapping VIN in beautiful light. And what happens is, and this was the shocking part, the speed lights over here were throwing shadows that way. And the speed lights over here were throwing shadows that way. But they were each filling the shadows of their neighbors. There's a synergy created. And what I realized is I can create soft light without putting anything in a soft box. So if I'm shooting high speed sync, this was a high speed sync shot in order to dim the ambient Okay, I needed to shoot it about a thousandth of a second to make those clouds look 
dark and moody. It wasn't really a stormy day. The camera on its own couldn't capture the detail in the clouds. They're blown out. So I underexposed the ambient and brought the light to my subject. And so by going into high speed sync, I took a two and a half stop power loss. If I'd been using a diffuser, a disc, a softbox, or anything, I would have taken another two stop hit in the power. So this idea of gang light. So if you have a couple of speed lights and your friend has a couple of speed lights and somebody else has a couple of speed lights and you guys get together for a shoot, then you can do exactly this. You can wrap your subject with a whole bunch of speed lights and forget the modifier. So what are the options for triggering multiple speed lights? All right, we're going to look through the four main categories. Canon's built-in wireless system takes a lot of heat. It's really confusing and hard to learn. It's like learning a foreign language. But I have to tell you, after working with this for several years, I've done a pretty good job decoding it for myself, I think. I'll get you into the basics today. But this has become my main way of using multiple flash. Everybody's like, it's crazy. It doesn't work. You take it outdoors. It doesn't work. I tell you, I shoot this built-in system outdoors under California sun, which they tell me is the same sun you guys have here in New York. All right? I shoot this outdoors under full sun all the time. The trick is you just have to know how to make sure that the slave eye sees the communication coming from the master. All right? So we're going to go into the details of how to do this. Another option that a lot of people like are manual radio triggers. Now by manual, what that means is that you're going to have to walk around to each and every speed light and change the power level. That's fine if it's a calm, collected kind of place. You can walk around if you're doing headshots or whatever. Great. No worries. If you're photographing you know, a gymnast going through his or her routine, maybe not so great to have to continually walk around and change the power level. Manual radio triggers can be as inexpensive as 20 bucks and as expensive as, say, 300 bucks a unit, $300 or so for that Pocket Wizard Multimax on the right-hand side of the screen. My favorite middle-of-the-road approach is shown on the left-hand side of the screen. That's the Ellen Chrome Skyport. It's about 200 bucks for radio, transmitter, and receiver. So you've got to have a piece to go on your camera and one to go on each of your speed lights. Or you've got to have a splitter on the receiver and jury rig them that way. So basically what this system enables you to do is to tell your speed light or your studio strobe, fire. It doesn't say anything other than fire. $20 trigger says fire. $300 trigger says fire. It doesn't say anything beyond that, all right? Now, ETTL radio triggers. ETTL is Canon's proprietary technology, evaluative through the lens metering for flash. And basically, this is how the camera and the speed light work together to calculate what the flash power should be, in theory in theory. It comes close most of the time. Sometimes it's dead on and sometimes it guesses wrong. But it's still the photographer's role to control that. Now with an ETTL radio trigger, we've got some advantages. We can shoot in ETTL or we can shoot in manual or we can shoot in stroboscopic. Okay? And we can control the system from our camera. Some of the radio trigger technologies give you the ability to use the entire menu system that's on the camera. And some of the radio trigger technologies give you a portion of that menu system, but not either. My favorite shown here is the Pocket Wizard Control TL system. That little gadget on the right-hand side is, for me, an essential part. It's called the AC3 Zone Controller. And what that does, ingeniously, is enable me to run part of my flash system in ETTL, part of my flash system in manual, and if I want to turn part of it on or off individually. That, unfortunately, is technology that Canon doesn't give us via the built-in system. I can't turn off group B, for instance, and run groups A and C for a while if I want to. Okay, so on that traditional shot, uh, traditional three light portrait I showed you where I had the key light, the fill light, and the hair light, I literally had to run around and shut those speed lights off so I could capture just the fill light or just the hair light. And it's important to do that from time to time so that you know what your various groups of flash are doing for you. So the AC3 zone controller, when parked on top of 
the TT1 or the TT5 gave me functionality and I have to confess it was a student of mine who showed me the AC3 zone controller and before that I actually didn't care for the system. Once he gave me that functionality I finally had that aha moment. If you're just starting out and you're looking for an inexpensive way, a relatively inexpensive way to get started, another option, this is very old school technology, is to put an infrared trigger into the hot shoe of your camera and basically what that is is a small flash tube behind a really thick piece of red plastic that sucks up all the visible light from the flash but allows the heat signature to pass through and then these little slave circuits can be plugged into the speed light. Canon speed lights don't have an optical slave built into them but on the 580EX2 there's a PC port on the side so you can get a slave circuit to plug into that or you can get a hot shoe adapter that has the little mini phone jack in it and then you plug the appropriate slave which is the one on the far right, that mini phone jack. One thing to know about is that if you're going to use optical slaves with Canon speed lights, the best ones to use are made by a little company called Sonia and Sonia makes slaves with green bases, yellow bases and orange bases. The green based ones are the ones that work with Canon flashes the best. You come upon the orange base, what's going to happen? It's going to fire one time and it's not going to reset. So the green base ones so solve that problem. I still have a few of these in what I call my MacGyver box. This is a little tackle box I carry with me with all these random parts. If I find myself in a situation where I've got to shoot somebody else's flash or studio strobes and I want to throw a few speed lights in there, it's handy to have these optical slaves. I don't use them very often, but boy, they save my hiney from time to time. Can you use it, when you said that, can you use these as like a Nikon, if you have a Nikon flash, you can plug one of these in? Sure. Now, Nikon speed lights have an optical slave circuit built in. It's called SU4 mode. And so if you turn on SU4 mode in your Nikon speed light, you will basically have, it will fire when it sees a pulse of light. Now one thing to understand though is that if you're mixing Canon and Nikon speed lights and you're using the Canon speed lights with a built-in wireless system, as you're going to see in just a moment, the master is going to communicate to the slaves via a series of pre-flashes and those pre-flashes will trick the Nikon speed light, the SU4 sensor, into firing early. That by the way is true for most studio packs as well. So it's kind of a challenge. If you're going to run a mixed system, you have to basically run everything in optical slave mode, okay, rather than use the built-in wireless system because when we talk about the master, very convenient segue here, okay, the master speed light is the speed light that's connected to the camera's hot shoe. Now you have to have that connection one way or the other. It could be right in the hot shoe or in the case of what I've set up here, there's a 33-foot cable between the hot shoe and the speed light over in that soft box and I don't think the camera has any idea that I moved the speed light away from hot shoe because the camera can still talk to that speed light. So the master's job is to send instructions to the slaves and it does that via a series of pre-flashes. Now this Morse code of light comes out of the master so rapidly that we don't see it as being a distinct flash separate from the flash of the exposure. Some people who have supersonic vision claim that they can see it. I'll let them believe that. I'm not sure that we can. One thing to know about the master also, particularly if it's in the camera's hot shoe, is that you have the ability to disable that master. And we're going to go through how to do that in a, a little bit. But disabling the master is a very valuable tool. And what that means is not that it's no longer the master, but that it communicates the instructions to the slaves through the Morse code pre-flashes and then when the shutters actually open it goes dark. What's the problem with a speed light in the hot shoe in terms of the light that it throws at the subject? Well it hits the subject from both sides of the lens equally. All right. How many, quick, quick question, how many of you are coming this afternoon? Okay. Thank you guys for, you're going to hear this again, but we'll do a quick sidebar. When you throw light right at your subject from the hot shoe, you're basically killing the shadows, and it's the shadows that enable us to see the shape and texture 
of the person or thing we're photographing. So if you move the, cam the speed light and the camera apart from each other, then your speed light is creating shadows which give you t texture. So more often than not, i get to it real quick, more often than not, your speed light, if it's in the hot shoe, needs to be disabled as a master or dialed down to a very low power so it's just pushing some light into the shadows. Because if you have it on full blast, it's going to kill all the shadows. Okay, question. Just very quickly, I'm yeah. just looking at what you're listening. I only have a 430. Does that apply or not? So, great question. 430 series cannot be used as a master. Okay, you're going to see in the next slide, or two or three, that it can be used as a slave. Okay? So, for a master, you have to have a 580EX or EX2 or the old 550EX will also work, as will Canon's two macro lights, the ring light and the twin light, okay? Now, somebody over here has an STE2 controller. This is a little box that sits in the hot shoe, okay? I'm not a fan, and the reason that I'm not a fan is that it's not a very flexible piece of machinery. For instance, I can't turn it sideways if I put my slaves over here. I can't turn it up if I put my slaves over here. If I go out into that bright California sun, it often is blinded because it has a real low power flash tube in it, okay? If you're indoors, more often than not, it's going to get the job done, okay? As will the pop-ups on the 7D and the 60D cameras. It's really been exciting to see Canon for the very first time in the history of their speed lights, enable a pop-up flash in your camera to control an off-camera speed light. So what camera body do you have, ma'am? Uh-huh. Uh, uh, okay. So if you had a 7D or a 60D, mm -hmm. holidays are coming up, you never know. Um, if you had a 7D or 60D, you could control that 430EX as a slave from your camera. Okay. And I think, frankly, if you're beginning with, and you have one speed light, using your pop-up is a great way to start learning. You'll eventually get the hang of it and go, gosh, I want to put my slave over here, and that pop-up is throwing all the signal that way. So I need something else. But it's a great way to get started, OK? One thing to realize is that we can use any mode with Canon's built-in wireless system. A lot of people think, oh, it's just ETTL, it's just automatic flash. No, you can run the entire system in manual. In fact, if you change the mode on the master speed light, the next time it sends out the pre-flash to the slaves, push the shutter button down halfway, it'll flash, the slaves are going to change mode. You don't have to walk around to each individual one and say, we're shooting this in manual now, or we're shooting this in stroboscopic. Slaves will follow. Basically, you set the slaves on the same channel as the master. And I'll tell you what that means in just a minute. I know I'm throwing out a lot of jargon. But it's an incredibly convenient technology to not have to be able to run or have to run around, rather, and change all the slaves from the power level or the shooting mode. Anything you do on the master will be communicated out to the slaves. So your slaves. Slave speed light, by definition, is off camera. I've had a few students try to put a slave in the hot shoe of the camera and think that they're going to put the master somewhere else. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Because if there's a connection to the camera's hot shoe, that becomes the master. All right? Now, you can have any number of slaves. If you all held up a speed light and we programmed them all as slaves, I could, of course, control everyone and everything. All right? So that's another very helpful thing. We don't have to run out with a couple hundred dollar bills every time we want to add a speed light to our flash system. This built-in system is free. We already have it. We just have to learn how to make it work for us. So in terms of slave speed lights, 580, EX, EX2, the 550, and the 430s, and then the new 320 EX and the new 270 EX2. The original 270, which is a just a kind of a little two, two AA battery flash designed for like the G series cameras and the smaller pocket cameras. It didn't have slave functionality. So I have now in my kit a 270EX Mark II with the slave function. And it's really handy. If I need to 
put a little pool of light in the shot because it's about this big. It's really tiny. I can just throw it in there behind a Coke can and it's going to throw light into the shot. It's very, very handy to have that technology. Now, this is a really important little detail that a lot of people miss. That big red panel on the bottom of the speed lights and every generation they come out with, it seems like that red panel gets bigger and bigger. That's for the marketing department as far as I'm concerned because we think those red panels are really important and we like them. The reality is that red panel controls the autofocus assist lights, which are relatively tiny. And that black panel that nobody ever pays attention to just above the red panel is the slave sensor. That's really, really important to know. Because a lot of people don't realize that it's that slave sensor panel that needs to be pointing towards the master speed light. If you get that, you go, oh, all right. Now all of a sudden this built-in system becomes far more reliable. So one thing you need to do, this is a simple two light shot. I've got my master on the camera and you can see I've turned the head over towards the slave. And you'll also note that I've turned the body of the slave so that the sensor is facing the master. We're shooting outdoors in full sun. Late afternoon in California, high speed sync, little headshot. Son number three, Tony, I'm sneaking him in. You've now met pretty much the entire arena arsenal of boys. So if you can sort out how to use the pan and tilt functionality on your master and get it so that it's pointing towards the slaves, you'll have great success with the built-in wireless system. Now sometimes the geometry of the shoot is such that an on-camera master can't illuminate multiple speed lights. So years ago, what I started doing, I have those OC3 cords, just little short coiled cords that Canon sells for about 65 bucks a piece. And I ended up with three of them to get like 10 feet of stretch on the master, like $200 worth of cords to move that, that master. So about a year ago, because I couldn't find anybody to do it for me, I started this little company in my garage, literally, called OCF Gear, and, and we sell these extra long ETTL cords. And the good news is that B&H has agreed to start selling them in the very near future. And the exciting thing about these cords is that I can now, for about 65 bucks, I can move my master off camera and use it to control multiple slaves, okay? Or, if you're thinking one step ahead of where these slides are, you can move your master off camera and have it contribute usable light in the shot as well as control slaves. So for instance, I can fire the master inside that of Westcott orb and have it control a slave speed light over here behind my subject. Okay? So I think these cords, a lot of people say, oh, poo poo, it's all wireless. It, it, you know what? Photographers have dealt with cords for a long time. Eventually, I have no doubt, eventually Canon will put wireless technology, radio technology, right into their speed lights. And we'll end up, at least some of us, paying for that technology. Okay? But in the meantime, the ability to move the master off the top of the camera to get new geometries is really, really exciting to me. So now, how do we get our speed light to work as a master? How many of you have a 580EX2? Okay, good number of you. How many of you have a 580EX? All right. So, and when they came out with EX2, I was a little surprised that they got rid of my favorite little lever on the bottom of the speed light. With an EX, it's very easy, as you'll see in a moment, to change it from being a regular old speed light to being a master or a slave. With an EX2, you have to know that that sideways flash bolt that's next to the word zoom, I call that the everything else button. You have, that's the gateway to the wireless menu on this speed light. 
maybe a radio tower with some you know, radio waves shooting out would have made more sense. But that signal, that symbol, is the gateway. So to access the wireless menu, to turn it as a master or as a slave, you have to push and hold that button down for three seconds. Now anything on your speed light menu that's flashing at you, it's basically saying, hey, do you want to change this? And so to change it, if you have a 580, you turn the wheel. If you have a 430, you push the two buttons. Okay? Until whatever selection you're looking for is on the screen flashing, and then you hit the set button in the middle. And you've locked it in. So a 580EX2, we're going to push and hold the zoom everything else button for three seconds. Eventually the word off flashes. We turn the wheel. Then master flashes, we hit the set button, it's now engaged as a wireless master. Okay? This is the old 580EX, 430EX looks exactly the same, except it doesn't have the master function. It says off, master, slave. Boy, that is so easy. Boom. Okay? The, I know the reason that Canon got rid of it is because the 580EX2 was weatherproof and shoot in the rain. Okay? I have to go on vacation to shoot in the rain, apparently. Um, and so that switch was not weatherproof. My guess is in a future generation, Canon will do something similar to what Nikon did in terms of the power switch. And it'll say off, solo, or something like that. Off, on, master, slave. So it's all right there. I miss this switch, but not so much that I use my 580EX as a master. I always use my EX2 because I can control it from the camera LCD. Stick with me on this part. I don't want anybody's heads to explode, but I'm going to go through some concepts relating to the wireless flash system. And this little flow chart is basically, if you keep hitting the zoom button, you go tap, 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 it's going to cycle through four menu options when your speed light is enabled as a master. So the first one is zoom. You're going to see this afternoon, for those of you who are coming, that I use zoom as a built-in light modifier all the time. I zoom my speed lights to 105 millimeters just to put light on my subject's face and not to light everything around them. So I zoom manually. That's the first tap. It gets me to that zoom button. Zoom flashes. I then turn the wheel until I get, typically I drive it straight up to 105 millimeters. If I hit tap again and my speed lights enable as a master, the word ratio pops up. I'll take you through what the ratios are, what that concept is. If I tap it again, it's going to say channel. I'll take you through that in the same sequence that we have them up here on the screen. If you tap it again, it's going to give you this crazy and really, really hard to see icon on your LCD. It's basically the, the Speedlighters gang sign, I think, enabled. You know, it's like my master's enabled. Now it's not. Now it is. Now it's not. Now it is. Really hard to see those. I'll show you how to do this on the back of your camera after I take you through the hard way first. And then you'll really appreciate that on-camera control. All right, what's this whole business about groups? Well, a slave can do or can be assigned to one of three groups, A, B, or C. Think of these groups as different work groups. They're going to do different things. Group A is maybe your key light. Group B is your fill light. And you want to adjust the amount of power between group A and group B so that you can control the contrast or the amount of bright and dark across your subject's face. The master's always a member of group A. Remember that. Master is always a member of group A. Even if the master's over on the right side of my set, because I always think of these ratio things, we'll talk about this, it goes A, B. I try to put my group A lights on the left-hand side of the camera and the group B lights so I can make sense of the numbers. But the master, wherever the master is, he's always a member of group A. Slaves can be members of group B and C as well as A. Don't use group C unless you absolutely have to. When I was trying to teach myself this, and I, I lovingly say I wish I'd been around when I was learning this stuff, because I immediately, you know, the artist in me said, oh, I want to use group A and group C. I, you know, I don't want to use B. Well, you can't do that. And the way that Canon approaches Group C is a real workaround, okay, in terms of ETTL. And manual, it's really easy to do three groups. I very seldom do ETTL three group. 
Cannon ratios. When we're shooting an ETTL, the automatic flash mode, camera and speed light are working together to determine what the flash power should be. If it says off, what that means is that every speed light, regardless of its group assignment, is going to fire off at the same power. Now, what is that power level? We don't know. The camera, the metadata doesn't tell us. Master fires out a pre-flash to the slaves. They all illuminate. Camera takes light meter readings, takes ambient meter readings, compares the two. That's the evaluative part. Comes up with its calculations of what the flash power should be. Tells us the master, here's what the flash power should be. Master pre-flashes that out to the slaves. They set themselves, and then they all fire at the right moment when the shutter's open. True magic, if you ask me. True magic. So when you say, when it says ratio off, everybody's going to fire at the same flash power. All right? If you want less light out of that system, out of a particular speed light, just move it farther away, keeping in mind that the farther away you move that light, the harder the shadow edge is going to become. I typically work with two groups, sometimes with three groups, OK? So A, B. A, B. Lock that in your head. It's not B, A. The first number, when we look at these ratios, always refers to the A side. Stop. A stop is my jargon for saying, I'm going to double or I'm going to have an exposure setting on my camera or my flash power. So if I change my flash power by one stop, from one half, I'm either dialing it up to full power or I'm going from half power down to quarter power. Either direction. Stop doesn't tell you what direction it goes. It just says I've either doubled or I've halved something. Using the concept of stops, I can make changes to my shutter because going from 125th to a 60th of a second is a one stop change. I can make changes to my aperture. Going from f4 to f5.6 is a one-stop change. I can make changes to my ISO. Going from ISO 400 to ISO 200 is a one-stop change. And as we work our way through advanced speed lighting techniques and we think we're going to dial the ambient exposure one direction and the flash exposure a different direction, we might be changing flash power and shutter speed in offsetting increments of the same number of stops. The only numbers that I have memorized, OK, and I've been at this a long time, I have the whole stops of aperture, OK? I mean, that's 1, 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5, 6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, 45, 64, 90, 128. I'm an old view camera guy. That's where I learned those numbers. But it's really helpful to have those aperture numbers memorized. I don't want to make anybody run out screaming and saying, I hate math. But when you're dialing all these knobs and dials in your camera, you see those things change inside your viewfinder. It's really helpful to know that when you've gone from 5.6 to 6.3 to 7.1, you've not made a two-stop change. You've made a two-thirds of one-stop change, because it goes 5.6, 6.3, 7.1, f8. So if you at least have the whole stops of aperture memorized, 5, 6, and 8, you'll know, OK, that's a big change. Question? Mm -hmm. A group is one stop yeah. lighter, I mean darker. Yeah. Thanks for reading. I appreciate that. Do you have any wide out? I'll just change that slide right now. I appreciate that. It, it is wrong. I hate forgetting that, but it is wrong. But you know, can I give away a B and H hat? Do you, would you like a B and H hat, ma'am? <laughs> uh, we'll go find one for you, because you, you pointed out. How about uh, a speed light? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> How about a hat? <laughs> okay. I'm not even sure I can swing the hat, but I'm going to try, OK? All right, you're absolutely right. So let's go down the list. One to one means that the A and the B groups are at the same flash power. One or two to one means that the A group is one stop brighter. Well, why is that one stop? Well, if we use the concept of stop being doubling or halving, two speed lights is one stop brighter than one. All right? 
The other side of the ratio, disregard the bottom text here because the B and the A right here and right here should be switched. It should say 1 and 2 B group is one stop brighter than A group. Get an A plus on that one. Absolutely. All right. So what if we have a 4 to 1 ratio? How many stops brighter is group A than group B? Pop quiz. Two stops. Two stops. What about 8 to 1? Okay, whoa, eight, eight, eight to one is three stops. How does that work? Well, that's the right answer, by the way. Here's how it works. Every time we change by a stop, every time we open up the aperture one full stop, every time we change the shutter one full stop, when it comes to flash power, it works like this. If we double one, what do we have? Two, that's a one stop change, all right? To get the next stop of power, how many speed lights do we have to add to that system? We have to double two, not the one. So we go one to two is one stop. Two to four is a second stop. Gets kind of expensive to get that third stop because we're adding four speed lights. OK? But that's why it's important to pick the right friends who have gear that they're willing to loan you. OK? All right. Channel's really easy. Compared to ratios, that, that is like the, the pinnacle of toughness when it comes to Canon speed lighting. Channels are really easy. Channel one, two, three, or four. It's like walkie-talkies. The master and the slaves all have to be on the same channel. Okay? So somebody was firing off my slave earlier, so I solved that problem by switching channels. It's up to you to figure out which channel I fired it off, fired off at. All right, now for the all-important concept of enabling and disabling the master. This is wonky vocabulary. If I could write the user manual, I wouldn't use enabled or disabled. Okay? Because disabling the master suggests that we've turned it off and it's no longer the master. And that's and that's my own that was my own exploration of the subject. It's like, well, that's how I turn the wireless system on and off. No, that's not. That's not it. So again, the concept is this. Enabled the master speed light is going to communicate the instructions to the slaves, and then it will also fire when the shutter is actually open. That happens so quickly that we seldom see it as being two distinct events. Disabled means that it does its pre-flashy Morse code, sends the instructions to the slaves, and then it remains dark when the shutter is open. You're still going to see it flash. Oh, absolutely. At, at the flash, you'll see a flash from the master, but the flash won't. You'll see the flash. You'll see the, so I'm going to program, so I'm going to hook this camera up to the screens in a little bit so you can see it, but I'm just going to, okay. I'm going to fire this off right now. You guys ready to be blinded over there? Okay, we'll go easy on you. We'll just go, you know, one eighth power, but here it comes. Okay, so this is, just check, uh, da -da, why are the settings enabled, master flash enabled, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is the flash, and now this master, which is in that softbox, if it's going to fire for me. Oh, of course it won't fire. I love this. Ah, uh, uh. compact flash card. <laughs> Camera wall. I love this. It's like, imagine the camera won't fire without a compact flash card. The camera in the custom functions has the ability to fire without the card. Oh, I thought that'll be really convenient because then I won't like make a fool of myself during situations like this where I'm being recorded. And then I make a bigger fool of myself self when I'm out on a shoot without forgetting to put a card in. So, here we go. Okay, so that was the flash with the master enabled. So it sent the instructions. The master has no idea how many slaves are out in this room. Right now there's none. Well, actually there's one, but it's not really paying attention. Okay, so I'll go in here and I'm going to disable the master. Did that flash look perceptibly different? Yes. 
Some of you see it. That's why I say some of you have supersonic vision and some of you don't. To my eye, it's like, yeah, something happened over there. It was bright for a little while, and now it's not. But I didn't see it go and send out that Morse code to the slaves and then pause, wait for them to do their pre-flash, do its calculations, send out the firing instructions, the, sig the timing signal, and then everybody fires. So the point is, now that master is disabled, but you're still seeing it fire, all right? So one of the challenges that I've run into from time to time is I'm shooting off camera master, boom, boom, boom. Then I switch this thing up and I put that guy in my hot shoe. And I'm not thinking through. And I s the master's not throwing any light in the subject. I think, well, it's not firing. That's because it's still in wireless mode and it's disabled. So question. It's throwing out light. Isn't it? it is. So why isn't that light? Because that, because that light is, that, that happens before the shutter opens. We're talking about thousands of a second here of difference. That's the amazing thing about the speed light technology. Okay? You can see that on your readout. Sure, I can point this. Okay, there's my, there's my beautiful image. Okay, so let's just see. Ah, the opaque. The regular transmitter, regular trigger, let's, let's be fair about this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say that again? All right, you're going to have to leave now. You, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's the image with my dead pixels on the back, of my rogue pixels on the back of there. All right, so really quick. Why am I doing this with the cable? That's a great question. I'm a total addict to the cable. And the reason that I'm a total addict to the cable is that if I have a master in the hot shoe, it's going to have a really hard time communicating with the speed light inside that softbox. Okay? The other thing is the cable is 65 bucks. The speed light in my hot shoe is 400 bucks. Okay? 475, whatever the current price is. They were they were 399 day before yesterday. All right, let's just do this really quick here. Enabled. OK, so there's proof. You don't need to see anything other than there's white, and there's the shot just before with the master disabled. So it does all of that flashy business, communicating to the slaves, and then it goes dark when it's disabled. OK, it's a key concept. But once you get it, it's like that aha moment. You go, OK, I get it. I get it. Okay, so on your speed light, <coughs> jump back here really quick. So you're going to, once your speed light is enabled as a master, you're going to use that zoom everything else button, tap, 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 and it cycles you through zoom, ratio, channel, master enabled, disabled. It's like a bus going on a circuit loop. If you miss the stop that you want, just keep tap, tap, tapping on the zoom everything else button, and you'll eventually come back around to that selection. OK? It just four stops and just goes in a circle. So in this case, you're going to, now I'm going to jump forward. And I will grant you that this is really, really hard to see on a Speedlight LCD. Good news is that. If you got the right speed light and camera, you can do it all in the language of your choice in the back of your camera, which is where we're going to head pretty soon. But on your speed light, if you've got a 580EX, you have to do it the hard way. Or if you have a 20D or a 30D, you're going to have to do it the hard way. Okay? Because to get the on-camera LCD control, you've got to have a 40D or newer camera body and an EX2 580 or 430 or the new 320, or the 270EX2. And what you're looking for, and it's hard to see, is that little Speedlighter's gang sign of three fingers right there. That means it's enabled, and when they're gone, that means it's disabled. OK? Yep. Sh No. Oh, so the question is, and if I don't repeat the question, you've got to kick me, okay? 
and you back him up, right? Just bring it on right there in the shin. So the question is, is there a way to get the master just to throw out a little bit of light? Absolutely. Okay. Anybody want to be brave and venture an idea as to how you do that? Compensation. You'd use ratios. And so if you, what, what group is the master always a member of? A. A for arena. All right. So it's always a member of group A. If we want to have the B group be more powerful than the A group, what kind of ratio would we use? One to two, one to four, one to eight, okay, would make the B group, your slave, brighter than your master. So you might go, if you're an ETTL, you might set your ratio to one to eight, which means that your slave is going to effectively be the key light, assuming that it's a similar distance from your subject than the master. And then the master is just going to push out a breath of air. These ratios are ETTL only. Okay? So ratios are ETTL only. How many of you feel like your head is spinning with all these concepts? I totally sympathize. My head is totally spinning. All right? Question. Negative exposure compensation also work. All right, you guys ready? You're not going to let you kick me. Gentleman asked, won't exposure compensation also work? Did you say exposure or flash exposure? All right. Canon has some functionality that Nikon doesn't have that I really like. Canon's f exposure compensation is independent of flash exposure compensation. Exposure compensation gives us the ability to control the ambient exposure when we're shooting an aperture exposure shutter priority. It, flash exposure compensation gives us the ability to dial the ETTL flash power up or down. If you're shooting multiple speed lights in different groups, flash exposure compensation dials the whole system up or down, not an individual group. So if we say we've got A group and B group here and we need more flash everywhere, then we dial flash exposure compensation up. If we need just the B group over here more powerful, then we use a ratio. See the difference? Great question. Great question. OK. So let's, let's talk about one of the hidden joys of the Canon system. I had an EX2 Speedlight for two years before I found this. And found was more like tripping into it, and then losing it for a while, and then finding it again. This is one of the aspects of our speed light system that I think needs to be shouted out to everyone in the world who shoots Canon. All right? This is a Canon only function. Much to my surprise, you can't get this functionality to the extent that we can get it on a Nikon camera. Because a lot of us have been beaten down by all those guys who shoot Nikon who blog. My, my sensei, Joe McNally. All right? Um, by the way, his new book, Sketching Light, is coming out any day. It's a must-have, OK? Sketching Light by Joe McNally. Joe shoots Nikon, so there'll be parts of the book that don't translate. But you know, you know how to get in touch with me, so you can ask me how to translate for McNally. Um, but they can't do this. All right, so let's go ahead. And David, we're going to go ahead. Let's go ahead and switch this over. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch over the projector. And we're going to actually um, hook my camera up so that I can show you how I use this menu system. And then I think some of you will understand why I choose to have 33 foot of cord between me and my speed light that I can trip over all the time. I gotten to be pretty good at the ballerina dance thing. Um, because this functionality is so, so great. I think we'll have to power the camera down and... Which time Oops. Uh, great question. Which camera am I shooting? That is so important when we're talking about this. That doesn't look good. All right. I have a 5D Mark II here. And that's really important because this speed light menu is in a different spot on almost every camera. All right. So let me get this hooked up here. David, I think this is broken. 
Do you have a spare? It looks like I stepped on the cord and it discombobulated. Okay, so there's these two speed lights, and they go into a bar. And the first speed light says, does anybody know the rest of this joke? Because I, I, I don't, and I'm trying to, like, Let's put a little more shot. Yeah, think, all right, here we go, Captain. So we're going to be putting that on your account if it's uh, not That's, please do. Oh, and I owe this lady a hat here, too. She pointed out a mistake in one of my slides. And then escort her out of the building, please. <laughs> No signal. No All right. Signal. Okay. I'll get you another. Sorry one. about that. Okay. It's trying, but because it, it's not coming up on my. You want to try it? Yeah. Sorry. Let me switch you back over to the other. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Paper. You can't just run out there and grab one. Well, I gotta run down the steps. I come up with the new and original problems. Sorry about that. This doesn't work for the 580. So, going back to it, here's what we need for gear. Camera-wise, mid-2007 is when they introduced this technology. So camera-wise, a 40D, 50D, 60D, 7D, 5D Mark II, now my brain fog is coming up, the 1DS <coughs> Mark III I think is in there, um, the 1D Mark IV, uh, the Rebel T3, 3i. All right. I, since I shoot the 5D Mark II, that's I, I unfortunately don't know those Rebel models as well as I should. Mid 2007. You can check in your camera, and when David bails me out here and uh, um, charges my account for that very expensive little piece of plastic I broke, you'll be able to see that we pull it up, and the menu position changes. So on a 5D Mark II. It's on the yellow wrench three dot menu. On a 7D, and you'll see what I mean by this. On the 7D, it's on the red camera one dot menu. All right? So you've got to have a compatible camera body, and you've got to have a compatible flash. So the 580 and the 430 EXs don't have this communication link. The 580 EX2 has the communication link. OK? So as do the, does anybody here have the 320 EX? It's kind of a, a mid-sized speed light and Canon put a little LED light on there theoretically for video work. I'm a bit of a skeptic, I'll, I'll say, because it's on axis light um, and video follows the same rules of physics that photography does. So, yeah. I want to, can you use the 580 EX2 with the 580? Sure, the question was, I don't want you guys, you're thinking about it though. Good job. Gentleman asked, can you use a 580EX with a 580EX2? And the answer is yes. Either of those two speed lights will work as a master, but I would use the 580EX2 as the master and make the 580EX the slave so that I can get this on camera control. I do have a couple of screenshots I'll show you, but it makes a lot more sense to see it live, and I'll take you through the entire wireless menu system. So on the left-hand side of the screen is a screenshot from the 7D. 6DD works along very similar lines. And it gives you the ability to control the built-in pop-up flash as well as an external speed light. Okay? Now, one of the things down below, this is a screenshot off my 5D Mark II and controlling the flash power in manual. So when I get this system up on the screen, you'll see I can control the power level in manual mode of group A, group B, and group C independently. Okay, And I'll show you why, when I shoot three group, why I prefer to shoot in manual rather than in ETTL. All right, we talked a little bit about flash exposure compensation. So let me just back up. Even though it doesn't relate to wireless per se or multi-speed lighting per se, it's an important concept. When we're shooting an ETTL, the speed light throws out a pre-flash, and the camera takes an ambient meter reading, meaning no flash meter reading, flash meter reading with, from the pre-flash, an ambient meter reading again, 
compares all these numbers coming back, how much light's coming back, where it's coming from in the metering zones, if the speed light's in the hot shoe and just pointed straight ahead, not panned or tilted, it will also take the distance information off most Canon lenses. And all of this trying to figure out what flash power it should be. Now, the camera has no idea what your vision is as the photographer. These cameras are really, really smart, but they're not replacement for the human vision and the human sense of imagination. So in ETTL, often the image will come back being too bright in terms of flash or too dim. Those of you who are going to attend my Lighting Persona seminar will see how I put flash exposure compensation to use. The short answer is that flash exposure compensation gives you the ability to dial the flash power in ETTL up by a certain amount or down by a certain amount. And the amount is specified by you. And it can be from one third of a stop, plus or minus, all the way up to three stops, plus or minus. Now keep in mind, if your speed light's already firing at a half power level, adding two stops of power doesn't get you beyond full power. We can only go, if you say an FEC of two stops and your speed light's at half power, and the challenge is we don't know what flash power we're firing at when we're in ETTL. Now I use ETTL a lot, but I also use manual a lot. I use ETTL when I'm working really fast because I can take a shot, I'll look at the back of the camera and say, do I want more or less flash? I'll use flash exposure compensation to dial it up or down, and then I'll take my other shot. Manual is great because it's consistent from frame to frame to frame. Woohoo! let's give it up for David. Yeah. Bails me out once again. So manual is great, and it's the flash mode I use when I'm doing very repetitive photography. If I'm shooting product, if I'm shooting um, a group, if I'm shooting, uh, I shot an event last year where I had to do VIP portraits. Okay, I had Danica Patrick and a bunch of VIPs, and I had 15 minutes to shoot something like 60 people with Danica. So do the math. That's 15 seconds per session. And Danica very kindly let me know just before we were starting that she had no intention of standing there for all 15 minutes, that if I was the professional photographer I should have been, that we didn't need it. In fact, I got the job done at 11. So we shot 60 setups with Danica, 60 VIPs with Danica in 11 minutes. For that kind of situation, you absolutely don't need to re-meter because the lights are not moving, she's not moving, nothing is changing other than the people standing right next to her. So I use manual for that. Manual also is the mode you should use when you're learning flash. Because if you only shoot an ETTL, then you'll never have an idea of, well, this thing's overexposed, but I'm not sure why. Whereas if you're shooting in manual mode and you dial the power to full and it looks like a nuclear blast, you go, oh, OK, that's full power. I'm going to dial it down one stop to one half power. Oh, that's not much of a change. I'm going to dial it down to a 30 second power. How many stops? Pop quiz. How many stops from half power to 30 second power? Well, let's see. If we go to quarter power, that's one stop. Eighth is two stops. Sixteenth. Thirty second is four stops. It's helpful to know four stops is a big move on flash power. OK, so I'm going to be very careful, since I apparently just purchased this, or the broken one. So here's what I mean when I say red camera one dot. This is a 5D Mark II, OK? So if I had a 7D, the flash control menu is on red camera one dot, OK? But to find it on the 5D, I scroll over to the yellow wrench with three dots. And conveniently, it says external speed light control. So what's happening is the camera, this is good. I'm going to do this again. I'm going to these cameras were not made to shoot HDMI. They were intended to like put your camera safely on the TV and look at your slideshows. So um, anyway, what's happening here is the camera is communicating to the speed light over inside that Westcott Orb softbox. And if you were looking at the back of the speed light as I make changes here, you'd see the changes happening on the back of the LCD. This is literally the flash control menu out of the speed light. So one of the things I can do is I can change the mode. 
So ETTL, the automatic flash mode. The other th reason that I use ETTL that I didn't mention is if I'm shooting a situation where the subject to flash distance changes, let's say it's your granddaughter on a swing set, and sometimes you photograph and she's way back at the back of the arc, and other times you photograph and she's about to kick your teeth out, okay? When she's farther away, the flash needs more power. When she's closer, the flash needs to fire at a lower power. So ETTL is going to do that calculation and come darn close, okay? So if I'm in a situation where I want to use ETTL because my subject to flash distance changes, or because I just want to run, take a shot, look at the image, make a move in flash exposure compensation, and keep running, then ETTL is great. Again, if I'm shooting a situation where things don't change, then I'm in manual mode, or if I need that consistency from shot to shot to shot, if that's important, then I'm in manual mode. I would say it's pretty close to 50-50 in terms of where I spend my time. Multi-flash is the stroboscopic function that 580 speed lights have, 580 EX and EX2. Want to know a big secret? Your 430 EX will jump into stroboscopic mode when it's set as a slave. I've never found it mentioned in any of the Canon literature. I don't know, maybe it voids the warranty, I don't know. But a 430 EX is happy to fire off in stroboscopic mode just like a 580 EX is, all right? Stroboscopic is basically where you get the flash to fire a whole bunch of times, but you really have to be shooting on a pitch black set, otherwise your ambient light, even over the course of a second or two, is going to creep in. So for right now, we're going to say that I'm in ETTL mode. I can change first curtain or high speed sync. This is a curious point about Canon system. When the wireless system is activated, so I'm going to go back there and shut it off. When the wireless, oops, when the wireless system is activated, we lose the ability to have second curtain sync. All right? If this was a fundamental flash course, I'd show you slides of second curtain sync. Suffice it to say, if you're shooting things in, with long shutter speeds, shooting a, a holiday parade with folks who have glow tubes taped to their body and all that, then shoot in second curtain sync, and you'll get that blurry ghost image coming from behind them, whereas when you have it in first curtain sync, what happens is they get that ghosty thing going to the front of them and it doesn't quite look natural. If you shoot, if you shoot weddings, bar mitzvahs, and those kind of things, people on the dance floor, same thing, where part of the image is being captured through a long shutter speed, and then high speed sync. How easy is it to turn on high speed sync? We have a dedicated button on our speed lights, the one with the H and the flash bolt or we can do it right here. The nice thing about doing it here is if I say, oh gosh, I've got to go into high speed sync because I need faster shutter speeds, I don't have to run over to that speed light, open up the soft box, reach my hands in and do it over there. All right? So we're just going to go back to first curtain sync. Flash exposure bracketing, in my opinion, is a legacy of the film era. When I used to shoot view camera in medium format, we would bracket everything. We'd bracket our shutter and our aperture, and we'd bracket our flash power. We'd basically take nine shots in the hope that one of them would work. And at $1 a frame for roll film, or $5 a sheet for view camera work, it was really expensive. One of the joys, there's nothing about film that I miss. Uh, one of the joys is I don't have to bracket uh, like crazy anymore. Flash exposure compensation. So this is the mode when we're shooting an ETTL that enables us to increase or decrease the amount of flash. And if we're shooting multi-flash, it's going to raise or lower the entire system. So watch this. Flash exposure compensation is active. If I go here and turn it to manual mode, we don't have flash exposure compensation. Why do we not have flash exposure compensation with manual flash? Right, you are the flash exposure compensation person. When I switch this over to manual flash, I'm now dialing the power up or down, okay? And by the way, the fact that the cords here is immaterial in terms of pulling up this menu. I'm pulling up the menu because I've got a compatible camera and speed light. If you have your speed light right here, it's gonna do the same thing, okay? 
I use this on-camera system all the time, even when my speed light is right here. How about Zoom? We're talking about multi-speed lights. This is an important aspect. I generally want my master speed light, if it's disabled, if it's communicating to slaves and it's not part of the shot, I want my master speed light zoomed as wide as it needs to be to hit all the slaves. Auto mode normally means that when I have a zoom lens and I change the zoom on my lens and I hit the shutter button, the speed light is going to change the zoom setting. Come back. All right, we'll take a picture. There we go. Okay. So one of the things I can do is I can change the zoom. So if you guys will be really quiet, you can hear it. You'll hear it zoom. Did you hear it zoom? The gentleman says yes, <laughs> fortunately. Um, not a huge thing to hear it, but I think it is kind of nice to be able to say, oh gosh, you know, I got it in that soft box. I should have it zoomed out wide so that it fills up the soft box, okay? Wireless setting. So disabled. Boy, doesn't this get confusing? Because we've got master enabled and disabled, and we have wireless function enabled or disabled. So wireless function is the on-off switch. So right now, disabled, I have no wireless functionality. That speed light is working by itself. It's all alone in the big world. OK? So I enable it. Master flash. Do I want it on or off? Boy, this is so much easier than looking for those th three little flashy things on the speed light LCD. OK? This functionality for me was worth upgrading from my EXs to my EX2s. I own five speed lights. I have three 580 EX2s and then two EXs. Of course, that was the justification I used for getting the you know, additional ones. But having at least one EX2 in your system if you've got a compatible body. Channel, all right? So important thing to remember here, I'm changing the master only. I still have to change the channel on my slaves directly, OK? So I can change the channel here. So now you know what channel. All right, whoever was firing my slave earlier, avert your eyes. I'm going to change. OK. Flash firing group. This is the ratio business. What flash mode do we get ratios with again? ETTL. OK. So in this case, A plus B plus C, little disconnect between the menu system and what I showed you earlier in terms of the nomenclature on my speed light. Speed light is going to say ratio off. You don't see any of this menu system, do you? Because you need a speed light in your hot shoe to get the menu system up. Yeah. What camera body is that? 7D. OK. Will you give it back? It's a little different anyway, right? Here. I got one. OK. Well, get it out and put it in so you can follow along with the song. OK. So A plus B plus C is the same thing when the speed lights LCD said ratio off. All the groups are firing at the same flash power as calculated by the camera. A, B, look at that, OK? So now A, B in manual mode gives us the ability to control individual groups. What do you think happens if I change this to A, B, C? OK? I now can say, all right, my hair light, my fill light, and my key light. OK? Do you guys notice by chance that I'm staying with those whole fractions? I mean, even as a pro shooter, I generally stay with the whole stops of flash power. I don't jump around. These two little dots in between are one third stops. I make big changes until I get really close to where I want to be. Then I'll fine tune. Write this down, but don't tell my kids I said this. You don't know that you've gone far enough until you've gone too far. <laughs> Remember, don't tell my boys. You've met them all now. You don't know that you've gone far enough until you've gone too far. I firmly believe, particularly with flash power and making big steps, until I go, oh boy, that's too much, or oh boy, that's definitely too little. Well, the good news of stepping over that boundary is that you then know the right answer is somewhere in between. But I still stick with these whole stops. 
of flash power until I get really close and most often whole stops is gonna do great. Somebody says, oh yeah, up at one and two thirds stops. Gosh, I I'm just, I'm just don't believe that one and two thirds for most people is visibly discernible as being different than a two, two stop move. Okay, so that's what these little dots are in between. Quarter, a one stop change is halving or doubling. Why so, aren't you on full power? Sir? Why am I not on full power in manual mode? All right, great question. So when I'm in manual mode, I'm not using a light meter. I have my old flash meter, my Minolta flash meter four in my kit. It's there really now, it's been in my bag. It's not on this trip, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a nervous breakdown, but um, it's been in my bag for 15 years and I stopped using it seven years ago. It's kind of like the old ratty teddy bear that's just tucked in the corner. I am gonna have a breakdown later, I hope you guys won't mind. Um, so my approach is the following. I turn, when I'm in manual mode and I don't have a clue where to start, I set everything to 1 8 power, okay? 1 8, 1 8, 1 8. All right, and then I'm going to make my decisions from one eighth power. Do I need more or less? If I need more, then I'll jump up to full power. All right, was one eighth closer or is full power closer? And within three shots, I can get the flash exposure that I need. So I could say, oh yeah, one eighth wasn't enough, but full is way too much, so I'll jump down to quarter. And generally, that's probably where I need to be. So if you start at 1 8 power in manual mode, you're halfway up or down, and you just jump to one end or the other, then you jump halfway back. And within three test shots, using the LCD to evaluate the lighting, I still use the histogram to evaluate my exposure. Lighting and exposure are two completely separate, albeit related, but separate questions that you ask your, your, your camera. So what happens to all of this? Ah, oh, we don't want picture style. Here we go. I'm gonna change this back to ETTL, wireless settings. So now when I have AB, see how this has changed? Before in manual mode, when I had AB, it said group A power, group B power. And now it has that ratio business. So if I wanted the A side to be significantly brighter than the B side, I might jump to four to one. I'm trying to keep it really simple here, okay? So also, again, I put my A lights when I can on the left side of my camera. If I'm doing that traditional three light headshot thing, okay, I'll put the A light on the left, the B light on the right, because that's the way these numbers work. If then, then I want the right side to be brighter, I dial my ratio. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. I'll dial my ratio to the right-hand side. If you have your A and your B lights on other sides of the lens, then, that, then you've got to go backwards, OK? So you see down here it's grayed out, and it says Group C exposure compensation. Here's the challenge that I have with the execution of three-group lighting in ETTL. I get the AB ratio business. I can, I, I can wrap my head around that. What's more of a challenge for me, though, is that Canon system uses the C group flash exposure compensation relative to the AB group ratio, and my head just about explodes, and I'm thinking, I'm not going to shoot wireless. Okay? When I'm shooting three group, more often than not, I'm in manual. If you try to do this on your speed light, boy, that LCD gets to become really a challenge. I have to actually pull out a little chart to find my way through this. You can do it pretty easily on your speed light, or on your camera LCD rather than your speed light LCD, okay? So getting back out of here, we'll turn that whole system off. Flash firing, here's a quick trick. For a long time I didn't understand why I'd want to have a speed light in the hot shoe, but have the ability to turn it on or off, or shall I say, enable it or disable it. Why would I want to have a speed light in my hot shoe but disabled? Not a wireless master, but just a single speed light. Anybody here shoot weddings, bar mitzvahs where things are dark? Okay. 
if you're in a dim environment where the camera can't find enough contrast in the scene to, to focus on, put a speed light in the hot shoe, disable it if you don't want on-camera flash, and all of a sudden what you have is an autofocus assist beam that like a Cylon from Battlestar Galactica will reach out there, okay? <laughs> and all of a sudden the camera can focus. All right, so there is no way, as far as I know, to do this on a Speedlights LCD directly, okay? All right, so enable. This one always bites me in the high knee too because it's all of a sudden your speed, you do this and then your speed light's not firing and it, you see everything, it's like, oh yeah, let's go check that menu. Okay, any questions on the flash functionality in terms of driving it on the camera? Yes, in the back. Okay, so the question, I don't want, these guys are like, oh, come on, don't say the question so I can kick you. So the question, if I understand it right, is if you have your master off camera, what do you need to do to connect that master to the camera so you can do what I just did? Okay, my master right now is sitting inside that softbox over in the corner, and I used this 30-foot ETTL cord from OCF gear, okay? So use a long ETTL cord as one option. Um, I mentioned the Pocket Wizard Control TL system, the Mini and the Flex. The challenge is that system has to translate for, in order to convert it to radio waves, it translates the Canon instructions into Pocket Wizardian, um, and then sends it over to, and retranslates it back to Canonista for the speed light. Well, you lose that, you lose most of this functionality in terms of on-camera. So right now, as far as I know, you've got two options. One is you put your master in the hot shoe and it's going to send out the instructions of the slaves and as long as your master is a 580EX2, you'll get this on-camera functionality. Or you have a 580EX2 over there in your softbox and you have an ETTL cord because the key is you need to be able to maintain that ETTL communication between the camera and the speed light. If you have just a regular old PC sync cord, which you can get for about 15 bucks, that doesn't carry, there's two wires in it. This one has five or six. So it carries that full communication. So those are the only two systems that I know of right now, okay? Okay, STE2, great question. So. The STE2 wireless transmitter, which sits up here, is 18-year-old technology. And it doesn't have that communication link. At some point, I have no doubt, Canon will come out with, what do you think it'll be called? The STE3, and it will have that functionality, okay? I recently tested a knockoff of the STE2 made by the China company Yang No or John Snow. My Chinese isn't very good. It's virtually a knockoff of that. And it has the camera menu system capability as well as the ability to turn that little box like, I don't know, 150 degrees either way. The unfortunate, the Achilles heel for me is that I, it's ETTL only. So I often want to shoot in manual mode. And when I turn that thing and I was like, OK, I can control everything just like I thought, oh, this would be really cool because it's 100 bucks. But the fact that I don't have that manual, I don't have half my flash repertoire just killed me. So the S is a long answer, but I'm sure the SDE3, whenever it comes out, will have that functionality, okay? All right, let me do, let me do this. I want to answer everybody's questions, but I also, we've got 30 minutes, and if you want, we can do, you know, democracy here. This is like the Occupy event space happening right now. <laughs> um, we can look at a bunch of shoots where I've used wireless, and I can talk to. I can run you through a bunch of shoots and setups, or we can do questions, or we can do both. I can take 15 minutes or so and do shoots and setups, and we'll go as far as we can, and then answer questions. Both. Both. Okay. Does anybody though, before we move on, because again, occupy event space, you know, all are equal. Um, does anybody have a question specifically relating to the on-camera control business that we've been going through? Yeah. 
I have six. And we'll start the bidding at $150. <laughs> um, <laughs> B&H will have them really soon. OK. All right, so question about this part? Uh, no, I just, I, just, I just want to know, can you use bead lights in conjunction with other lights? Can you use speed lights in conjunction with other lights? Like studio strobes? Yeah. Absolutely. The challenge becomes if the studio strobes have an optical slave on them, then you'll need to run the speed lights. You need to get rid of the pre-flash. So this right there fired a pre-flash. OK? And made a lovely photo, as you guys will see. OK, so um, is David back there? or cons OK. Um, I, we're going to change up this core. Do you know how to do it? I can talk you through the steps. I just can't see. Blind yourself there, Steph? Yeah, it's that, it's that <laughs> thing. All right. Great question. No, the, do I? I know you're getting. Oh, don't say, say the question. Can we use the cord at a wedding? No, it, it, that's the challenge. All right. Uh, obviously, having a 30-foot cable running between you and your assistant can be very problematic. If you're shooting just um, so, what we're going to do? Wait, wait. Uh, let's see. This cord. That one pulls out, and that one plugs in. That's that's as easy as it is. Okay. Um, so at a wedding, the cord's a liability. So if you get paid to shoot weddings, I think investing in um, the pocket wizard system makes a lot of sense. But it's an expensive buy-in because it's basically $200, $225 per unit. And you have to have a unit on your camera, and you have to have a unit for every one of your speed lights. Okay? So if you're shooting events, that's a good way to go. Yeah, question. The cords? I've ganged up. Um, it depends on the camera, and I don't have an ans a d explicit answer for this. You can gang up. I've ganged up three cords, so that's 100 feet. OK? Um, I've ganged up those cords, and they fire just fine. And yet I have customers who've written and said, I can't get one cord to work. Um, the 60D, some, some 60Ds have this like weird thing. It's like, I don't know if they have no oomph through the hot shoe. Some 60Ds work fine, others don't. Um, it's not Cat 5 cable. It's a little heavier than Cat 5. You know, Cat 6, I don't know. Um, question real quick. Uh, in, in your garage, when you first designed it, how come you didn't put a, a capability of a, putting a, 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 a flash on, on, the, on the part that goes onto the camera? Besides the, the Right, 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 right. Because um, it would have made my head explode um, as to why. Go ahead. Take your shot. I didn't repeat the question. So why didn't I put a hot shoe on top of the cord? Um, because that's a good idea first. Uh, I don't know. I have mixed emotions because I'm not sure um, how Canon's ETL system would meter for two masters because you're effectively enabling two masters. So I've got that one being a master, and I've got the one in the hot shoe being a master. And um, I, I really buy into the keep it super simple principle. But, but you can make the one on the, hot on, on the camera a, a slave. Um, lots of different options, and it, it, it became very cumbersome. I wanted a simple, straight solution. OK, so how many speed lights? We're gonna, I'll, I'll give you the answers, but I want you guys to throw out some ideas. You've got to throw them out loud. How many speed lights did I use to make this shot? Where was one of them? In the lampshade, where was the other one? In the hot shoe. OK. So I have a disabled master in my hot shoe. And there is the slave literally with the body of the slave rotated 180 degrees. So the sensor is pointing straight up. And the speed light, we put a rag on Arian's head so the speed light would balance. Literally, it was just kind of sitting there like this, OK? With the Stofan dome diffuser. OK. So one point for you guys. All right, how many speed lights in this shot? Good. It'd be handy if you like had chapter 21 open, I think, in your book. <laughs> Six, eight. Anybody else? Three is the right answer. I, I, you know, I'm really proud of the fact I pulled this shot off with three speed lights. OK. So for the bonus question, which one of my sons is this? Num the youngest. Number, this is Tony. Who, 
turn 14, day before yesterday, 14 going on 40. Okay, so this is an example of when the geometry of an in the hot shoe master will not work. Tony was just a couple feet in front of me. It was literally 118 degrees in Paso Robles this day. He didn't mind at first having all this water poured on him, but he's got no body fat because he's a, a strong young athlete. And after like five minutes, he was standing there shivering because of all this water that was being dumped on him. The geometry of the shoot wouldn't work with the master in the hot shoe because basically I had the sun high behind Tony and I had the two slaves right over my shoulder angled steeply down, almost to mimic the angle of the sun. <clears throat> Those slaves, we couldn't orient those slaves so that the eye was facing the camera without them looking into the sun. So the easy go-to thing when we're shooting slaves in sun is to turn the slave eyes completely away from the sun and move the master on a cord to a spot where it literally fires straight into the sun. The master doesn't care if it's firing straight into the sun. So we've given the slaves a set of sunglasses by turning them away from the sun, heads pointed towards the subject, slave eyes pointing away. Drop the master literally on the ground about 15 feet behind me and it just fired up and sent the signals to the slaves. This geometry absolutely would be unworkable with, because, how do I know that? Because we tried. Again, I'm lazy. If I don't have to get out the cord, I don't want to get out the cord. Tried it with the master in the hot shoe, it didn't work, got out the cord, turned the everything around it worked just fine. Here's my friend Mark Cranach. All right, anybody read the blog Jersey Style Photography? Mark's a great guy, should read it. Um, this is Mark and in Asbury Park and Mark's got this film noir thing. I mean he's got the gun, he's got the dame, he's got the Lucky Strike cigarettes. How many speed lights did I use to make this portrait of Mark in his and I can't do black and white anymore. I did black and white forever so even though film noir by definition is black and white this is as close as I can get to film noir. It's got to be in color. How many speed lights did I use? Two. 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 Two is the right answer. Where was the master? It was on one side or the other, okay? So actually, this says three. I want to say if I was going to do this today, I'd do two, okay? Just to show you again how that cord would work. We actually had three speed lights. Master disabled in the hot shoe. If I'd had the cord at the time, I would have run the cord off to left or right. I used a grid and I used gels. Okay? So the effect of the grid, we'll talk about this this afternoon. The effect of the grid is that it creates that pattern. The effect of the gel is that it changes the color of the speed light from being basically sunlight at midday to becoming a neon sign or a street light. Okay, how many? flashes on this one. If you look really closely, you can see, now you're not going to be able to look anywhere else, you can see two arm shadows. Okay? So again, in the hot shoe master disabled, communicating to two speed lights on a stand over here. And they were tipped sideways, and be, the way that I tipped them, I used this is called Elastolite Tri-Flash Bracket. It can hold three speed lights. And I had one speed light here and one speed light here. So there was about 12 inches between the heads. And that's why you see two shadows if you look really closely in that shot. Can you use the transmitter receiver as opposed to the cord, which you should have? Uh, can we use a transmitter uh, receiver? Okay. Okay. You just want to get the information from the camera to the flashes. So can't you use a transmitter and a receiver? So the question is, if you're just looking to get the information from the camera to the flashes, can you just use a transmitter and a receiver? The answer is yes, but the question becomes, how much information does that transmitter and receiver communicate? So ETTL radio triggers will communicate that full communication of master and slave business. Manual radio triggers only say fire now. Okay. Now, a Pocket Wizard Multimax can say that over about a half mile, but in the case of using speed lights a half mile away, it's not really part of my arsenal. 
Okay, this is one of my favorite setups here. How many lights in this shot? Three. Three is the right answer. Where are they? One low one. One to the right, one to the left, and one in front. Okay. The reason this is one of my favorite setups is it gives me an excuse to use my ray flash ring light adapter. All right. So I have taken my speed light in the hot shoe as a master, pushed it through the ray light, which basically sends that light down and around the lens and lets it fly out through a translucent panel. And that speed light is the master, enabled. So I get that look, that crazy hipster shadow of the ring light. And it's talking to two slaves that are behind the subject, all right? And one of the key bits of gear in my bag, even when I'm traveling light, I won't bring my book, but I have these, which tells you where I, what I think of these, okay? These are rogue flash benders, specifically the large size. Okay, they make a smaller size. I'm not as enamored with it, but the large is indispensable. And one of the things that we can do, and the key to making this shot work, is you can strap these guys on, okay? And if I have a light behind my subject and it's flying up to create that hatchet light that's glancing off his shoulders and his cheeks, I don't want this to flare into the lens. So putting the rogue flash bender on this speed light all of a sudden saved my hiney and gave me the ability to create this shot with that defined edge. This is sports. I was watching a little bit of ESPN last night and I was like, they're now doing this in video like in you know, beer commercials. Anything on ESPN has this kind of three light setup. So you want to do sports lighting, you got to like graze the light across your subject's rugged Why face. Um, let's go back and fly that. Okay, so, so the question is the hatchet lights are both in group B, all right, because I wanted them at the same power. If I'd wanted one side to be brighter than the other, I could have moved one light farther away because it's a hard light, so distance doesn't matter as much, or I could have put it in group C and run the thing in manual. But in this case, the typical, you know, again, I'm taking the simplest approach I can. I want group A on my ring light because it's my master. Group B is the hatchet lights, and I want them to be about the same brightness. So great question, though. Thanks for asking. All right, how many lights in this shot? And this will probably be the last one we look at. Maybe one more. Anybody want to venture a guess? Two. Two. Good start. Let's add one more, shall we? I think. All right. So this is the earlier generation of um, what I used in this shot. And I'll show you the set shot in just a moment. I had a Westcott Apollo 28 inch softbox, it's square. This is the new one, the Orb, and I like this more because it's a little bit bigger. But what I did is I took the tri-flash bracket and I put three speed lights on the cord. One is the master, two is the slaves, and we set it off. So here's what this shot looked like, okay? Now, this afternoon in Lighting Persona, I'm gonna talk about how I go about blending Fill flash at sunset in. The short answer is I use CTO, color temperature orange gels, or half CTO. Let's see what I noted in the, in the shoot. So full cuts of CTO. OK, so a very amber gel is what allows me to push this flash in because I have the sunlight coming from camera left. In fact, there was so much hard sun that you can see we actually threw up a Lastolite skylight panel with a reflector in it, just basically to put the subject into shade. OK? <coughs> All right, one last one. This is Chicago Bob. He is a um, living historian in Virginia City, Nevada, which is a fascinating place outside of Reno. How many speed lights? Two, Two one. OK. More importantly, what was the time of day? Come on, be brave. Late afternoon. Late afternoon. What was the weather outside? Sunny. OK, here's the real answer. It was three speed lights. It was pouring outside, and it was about 2 o'clock in a room that never sees direct sunlight. One of the cool things we can do 
is move the master, and I learned this from my sensei, Joe McNally, move the master to a window and have it communicate to speed lights outside. The joy of this system is I can change everything without having to run out in the rain time and time again. If I'm shooting in manual, I can dial the power up or down. Okay? So we went out and we put the speed lights up in a C stand. We gelled them to give that amber color, that look of sunset. Okay? And we angled them so that the long raking shadows went horizontally because that's what we know sunset light to look like. It's warm and the shadows go horizontally. The fact that it was raining, that just makes for a better story, but it really was raining. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and turn up the house lights and we'll spend a few minutes answering questions. You yeah. find the orb more rugged than the uh, No, <laughs> I'm laughing because when I was in Dubai a week before last demoing the orb, I broke one. Um, so actually, I, I have never had a problem with the, go ahead, kick me because I didn't answer the question. Um, so the question was, do I find the orb to be more rugged than the original Apollo? I would say not. And I don't have, I've only had an orb for about a month and I managed to break it. Um, I ne I've, I've yet to break a square a, a Apollo and I've done all kinds of things to them that should have broken them. So, um, but I, I will say this, I know from shooting it, I blogged about this on speed lighting a month or so ago, um, the quality of light coming out of this and the catch lights in the eyes is gorgeous, gorgeous. So we do have, okay, and one thing to note, the speed light is firing backwards. That's the way that a Westcott Apollo softbox works. It's got that silver interior. And what I love about that is the light flies to the back, it hits the silver, jumps around, gets all mixed up, and then flies forward. Really soft light. The other soft boxes I use are the Lastolite Easy Boxes. And those have the speed light mount at the back of the soft box, and the light flies forward. And in order to get the light to meld around, there's an inner diffuser. This. Where did, it, did we see the baby softbox? Wow, here it is. I was looking for blue and it's black. I was looking for the case and I already set it up. So this is, I love this, okay? This is the Last Light Mini Easy Box. And when I talk about the inner diffuser, this is what I'm talking about here. And they make bigger ones, 20 and 28 inches. Okay, this is the small one that works on softbox, or on, directly on speed lights. So, all right, question in the back. You have your light way up high in, in the uh, boxes. Do you find that creates uneven light? So the question is, in this soft box right here, I have the speed light mounted up really high. Does that create uneven light? Not to my eye. Um, I do try to angle the head down so that it hits about where the hub of the spokes is in the center. But I also have that head, would have that head zoomed out as wide as it would go to mix up that light as much as I can. The other way to think about that, though, I have a friend who shoots the Last Light Easy Box exclusively, and he zooms his speed light at the back of that softbox to 105 almost all the time, because, and then he uses it in really, really close because that gives him a little bit of a vignette, a little bit of fall off inside the softbox. To a large degree, that's also a function of how close the softbox is. Your subject question. Uh, the pocket wizard TT5 and TTL5, Flex TT5, is it good for the strokes, to trigger the strokes? So the Pocket Wizard Flex TT5 and TT1 is it to trigger the strobes. So the way that system works is you have the TT1, which is hot shoe only, or the TT5, which can be in the hot shoe or attached to the slaves. As the receiver. As the receiver. So it's a transceiver, meaning it can either be the transmitter or the receiver. Okay. So you can use that system. There are some challenges with the Canon speed light in terms of if you go past about 35 or 40 feet, there's some radio interference that will make the signal communication a little bit inconsistent. I have to confess, I seldom use speed lights 35 or 40 feet away from my camera. I'm talking about uh, studio strobes. Can you trigger studio mono lights? Ah, okay. I'm, so the question is, can you, will those work with mono lights? Yeah. As far as I know, the Flex TT5 and TT1 are for speed lights only. But I do know for a fact, because I've used them, they're fully backwards compatible with the entire Pocket Wizard line. So you can put a plus or a multi-max 
on your mono light, and it will time the firing of that mono light at the right moment so that it doesn't get confused with the ETTL pre-flash if you're using speed lights. Is that your question? Did I get you the answer? Okay. Hold on one sec. We'll go over to this side. I just want to be fair. Occupy event space. It's very important. In a room like this with a low white ceiling, what would you think about using your master flash pointing up to the ceiling? So in a, so in a room like this, which has an eight-foot acoustic tile ceiling, what do I think about using my master flash in here just fired off the ceiling? What, enabled or disabled? Enabled. Enabled. If you're at an event, it can provide um, a little bit of light. What I'm often trying to do in a room like this is skip that light way to the back corner because the folks up front often are lit well enough, but it's the light in the back. So I'll try to make that bank shot. The thing you have to be careful of any time you bounce light off the ceiling is that anybody who has deep set eye sockets, if the light comes down steeply, their eyes can go dark. So sometimes if I'm bouncing, I'll also do my little hand thing behind the speed light so that it's in the hot shoe and I'll just put my little hand up here. It's about a half CTO of warmth and it flies most of the light up but it also pushes a little bit of light forward into their eyes. I think the little slide is gimmicky in my opinion. The little catch light panel. I, I get better effects with my hand plus I hate I work, it's particularly at events, I'm working really fast and they have to pull this little thing out and, you know, it's just much easier to go boom and I get my shot and I'm moving on to the, towards the punch bowl. Okay, any more questions on this side? All right, question there. Any thoughts on using the quantum uh, flash with your Canon flash? Okay, so what are my thoughts on using the quantum Q flash system with speed lights? Um, my progression through the world of flash was when I was shooting medium format and view camera work for 15 years I used studio packs and then um, I started doing a lot of field work so I st and I still have it my old quantum Q like the original Q flash 400 watt seconds it's got a flash tube that's shaped like a hot dog which is a fundamental difference between studio flashes and mono lights and speed lights speed light has a flash tube and a little reflector with that flat panel and all the light flies forward so if you're trying to fill up a softbox or you're trying to fill up an umbrella, it can be a challenge if that mod is really, really big. Small, not a big deal, but a 60 or 74 inch umbrella can be hard to fill up with one speed light. Whereas a Quantum or a Studio Pack has a tube shaped like a hot dog or like a donut, see how everything relates to food around lunchtime? <laughs> Which throws the light in a sphere. It throws it out this way as well as out this way. So one of the advantages of the Quantums is that or to mono lights and studio packs as they fill up modifiers quite nicely. The Quantum is an interesting um, spot in the market in terms of being um, significantly more powerful than speed lights. But what you really give up, and this is a huge issue for me, is, is true high speed sync. I like the ability to shoot in high speed sync when I need to because I'm shooting outdoors under full sun a lot. Um, so if you don't do that kind of work if high speed sync isn't really important to you, um, because there's a lots of, lot of workarounds, Pocket Wizard has hypersync, um, a lot of ways to cheat and people say, well, we can increase the shutter speed. Well, if you get me from 200 to 500th, that's one stop change. I'm not going to dim the ambient light with one stop. You'll see this afternoon it takes three or four stops to do that. So I love quantums, but I also have some questions you know, about what I would really love, and I've said this publicly, I'll say it again, I would love a Canon speed light in the quantum form factor. Give me 400 watt seconds with ETTL technology, including high speed sync. I'll, I'll, I'll sell all three kids to buy that because I think for me that's the ultimate. Do they know? <laughs> They've met my kids, so it's not going to happen. Um, just, ki just kidding, Mom. All right. Yeah, I have. Um, thanks for. So, do I have rechargeable battery pack recommendations? The short answer is I am a huge fan of Eneloop batteries. Eneloops. They're, um, of course, I have the other brand here. I have Eneloops. Oh, I guess they're in here. Eneloops, E N E L O O P. E N E L O O P. They're here in the store somewhere. If it's not in the store, you don't need it. Um, Eneloop batteries 
The reason I like them very quickly, they are recharge, pre-charged rechargeable, or low discharge nickel metal hydride batteries. Problem with rechargeable batteries is if you charge them today and don't use them for a month, most of the charge is gone. But with Eneloops or any of the pre-charged rechargeables, Kodak makes them and other companies make them. Basically, if it says pre-charged and rechargeable, you're getting the battery technology that will have its low discharge nickel metal hydride. The other important side of it is your charger. Use chargers, and you'll have to ask the guys at the counter, find a charger that charges each battery on its separate circuit. Four batteries coming out of a speed light do not discharge at identical rates, so one of them is going to be more discharged than the other. But if you put those four batteries into a charger that has a single charging circuit, it's going to stop charging when the first battery is charged. So it's this vicious kind of ping-pongy thing. Speed light stops when the first battery wonks out. Charger stops when the first battery gets full. All right. So if you have a charger, an intermediate charger puts two batteries on a circuit. A really good charger will put each battery on an individual charging circuit. So I use a Maha 801D. M-A-H-A. And there are other chargers that do the same thing, but that's the importance. And the combination of using low discharge nickel metal hydride in a charger that has individual charging circuits has made my batteries be far more reliable than I deserve. What was your number, 801D. Do you like stands? Light stands, um, absolutely. All my grip gear is made by Avenger and Manfrotto although there's many other great manufacturers. I carry two light stands principally. I use the um, Manfrotto 5001B, which is the little light stand that folds up, the legs fold backwards up on the shaft, so it becomes a 17-inch pack, all right? Um, and then I also use the Manfrotto 5001, that's, no, that's not right, that's, that's the small one. It's the, I think it's 1005. And it's the, what are called the raker stands. And those are the stands. They're 10 foot high stands. And they fold up, the legs fold up flat. So for somebody who travels as crazily as I do, of course, I, I didn't bring any stands this trip. Um, that's how light I'm trying to travel. But those stands are really great because I can put three stands together in a package about this big. And yet they open up to be full bases. I also have C stands, but I don't travel with them because I can rent. Uh, a C stand anywhere. So, question. Do you have any experience with uh, radio poppers versus uh, quantum uh, the DTL transmitters? So, do I have any experience with the radio popper over the Pocket Wizard TT ones, um, or? I think no. It's I think Quantum makes uh, the ones that transmit DTL. DTL. So, Quantum has, as far as I know, Quantum has a module that works with their flashes in a TTL mode, which I've never I've never used. They told me on the show that they do, and it works with the Canon too, but I'm, I'm not sure. Right? You, you would think they would call me. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I have used radio poppers, and I found radio poppers to be very reliable. It's a different approach than pocket wizards in that the radio popper, you have to have a speed light in the hot yeah. shoe, and you have the transmitter, and it's basically picking up the electromagnetic pulse off the flash tube sending that out in real time to the receivers, which reconvert that to an infrared signal. Um, so the cover of Speedlighter's handbook was shot, the P Smashing Pumpkins shot was shot with a dozen speed lights on the set, all controlled um, with radio poppers, first generation radio poppers, the ones that had a little fiber optic probe. So, um, so I think that's great technology. There's some advantages to the Pocket Wizard system, particularly if you already have an infrastructure of pocket wizards that you're using in your studio already. One last question, anyone? How many flash heads have you worn out? How many flash heads have I worn out? All right. Um, I, have, I, have, uh, I have killed three speed lights. One I did with the, when I did what I, um, my AA battery torture test summer before last, I imported every kind of chargeable, rechargeable battery I could find. And um, that test fired like 25,000 full power flashes. Um, and I learned a lesson very hard. I used lithium batteries as part of the test, because a lot of people like lithium batteries. Um, and I can tell you the problem with lithium batteries is that they get super hot. In fact, the first time I dropped them in my hand, they almost burned. A friend said, oh, get an infrared thermometer. So I did that for the second round with a different set of batteries. They came out at 180 degrees. 
So ultimately, I fried that flash head with the battery test. The other two speed lights I broke um, during the same shoot one day, which was completely crazy too. I've done all kinds of things. These are really robust devices. Um, but at a skate park with pulling a light stand over with the speed light on the top didn't end well for the speed light. Um, so one bit of advice on that, if you're on a shoot and you're trying to impress your friends, do not flinch when anything hits the ground. If you flinch, then you're saying you're an amateur. If you want to be a pro, you just stand there and let your gear hit the ground like it's, <laughs> ah, you know, no big deal. And then you join Canon Professional Services, which costs you like 100 bucks a year, and you get a 20% discount on repair bills. And I've made up that $100 <laughs> pretty much every year, it seems like. But anyway. Okay, so all right. So websites. I'm gonna I'm gonna change your question. Websites that I like. Okay. Um, so you've got to check out Zach Arias's blog, Z A C K A R I A S. Particularly if you want to learn how to shoot white seamless. So which is part of a standard repertoire for anybody who wants to shoot. So if you literally Google. Zach Arias, White Seamless. You'll go to his three-part tutorial. But Zach has done a great job talking about Z-A-C-K and his last name A-R-I-A-S. A-R-I-A-S. So Zach Arias' blog. Um, heavy on studio lighting, strobus.com. Um, David Hobby goes through the world of small flash and large flash. It's not um, studio oriented exclusively, but a lot of good insight and the archive of information. It's the most active uh, lighting blog in the history of the blogosphere. It, Strobist, S T R O B I S T. Okay. If you've not hit up Joe McNally's blog, it's all Joe is the Indiana Jones of photographers. So always has a great story to tell and great lessons to learn. So from time to time, Joe gets in the studio as well. So those would, be the, those would be the three that I would jump at first. OK. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.